Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us today for our technical talk number four for the year. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker, Mike Ottiano, who will be talking to us on concrete durability and performance-based mixed design for concrete structures. Mike is an associate professor and is the head of school at the, of civil engineering and environment engineering at the University of Witzbach in Johannesburg. He holds a doctoral and master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Cape Town and a first class honors and bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. His research interests include concrete durability, service life protection, steel corrosion and reinforced concrete structures, and repair and rehabilitation of concrete structures. Please welcome me in joining um, Mike to our talk today. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona, for the generous uh, introduction. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here to speak to, to your members, uh, structural engineers, not uh, my common audiences in terms of day-to-day -day interaction, but uh, very important people in terms of uh, concrete, especially structural concrete and from a durability point of view. So I'm going to basically talk about concrete durability, performance-based uh, mixed design, but uh, I will give it more of a, of a wider outlook in terms of durability and uh, performance-based design, what is happening in South Africa in terms of, uh, of uh, durability index tests uh, and, uh, and, and so forth. So in terms of uh, my presentation, uh, I want to try and make it short so that uh, we can have some interac uh, interactive session at the end of, uh, of, of this talk. Uh, I will talk, uh, as I've already indicated, about durability of concrete structures in general and then uh, uh, move on to performance-based durability de design and specification. And I will also, of course, talk about uh, the construction aspects as well. Uh, I will talk about uh, the fundamental principles, how it can be implemented, and then touch on uh, the mixed design aspects. And then uh, I will have some closing remarks, and uh, hopefully we can have a very interactive uh, session. Uh, before I proceed, uh, I just want to say that uh, my talk is, uh, is, uh, is, to a large extent, really founded on, uh, on this uh, chapter that uh, we published, uh, we wrote and was published in, in the latest uh, 10th edition of the Fulton's Concrete Technology here in South Africa. And uh, myself, uh, Mark Alexander, and, uh, and Dr. Amin Prof. Prof. Hans Boyshausen, both at the uh, University of Cape Town, also, also co-authored this chapter. So uh, I will encourage you, if you haven't gotten a copy of this book, try and get it because it really speaks a lot about concrete durability. Almost, I, I suspect it's probably the, the, the longest chapter, chapter in the book. So there's a lot to cover in terms of concrete durability. And uh, I don't think I will be able to do it justice just uh, in this uh, less than an hour talk. But I will try and uh, touch on the main aspects and, uh, and hopefully we can really have uh, a, a gist of, of what uh, durability of especially structural concrete is. Now, to kick us off, uh, I will just talk about uh, concrete uh, deterioration. And uh, we know that concrete structures deteriorate and there is nothing really we can do about uh, preventing that. So we really need to, to just uh, ensure that uh, when we design our structure with a certain level of performance, we usually expect that the structure will deteriorate uh, according to this curve A up to a certain level of, of, of minimum performance, de depending on how that performance is defined. Uh, most of the time we would want the serviceability limited from a performance point of view before any action is taken or before the end of the life of the structure. But uh, in reality, our, most of our structures uh, are deteriorating prematurely, which means that uh, these structures are following this curve B. So they are, they are deteriorating faster than we would expect. Many reasons for that, uh, we will talk about, this is what this talk, this, uh, this talk is about. And at some point, we have to carry out either maintenance or repair action. 
And this is what we are trying to avoid because uh, this is expensive. We want to try as much as possible to ensure that our structures follow this curve. And even if we are not following this curve, our deterioration can be, can be to some extent uh, controlled. So in, in essence, what happens is that uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we will pay for, for durability at some point. Two options that we have. One that is that uh, we either pay for this durability as a capital expenditure at the beginning of uh, at the construction stage, at the design and construction stage, or we pay for it sometime later after the structure has deteriorated. And we know how expensive this can be. So this is a problem that we want to try and avoid and, uh, and uh, what we're trying to, to drive and, uh, and why, this is why durability is, is, an, is an aspect that uh, structural engineers need to take into account at the design stage, is that uh, it is much cheaper to, to, to invest uh, in durability at the design and construction stage as opposed to when the structure has deteriorated. So the question is, uh, why are, are, are our structures deteriorating? And there are many reasons for this. So one is uh, because of the poor understanding of the deterioration processes, whether it's, for example, steel corrosion, alkali silica reaction, soft water attack. We don't have, a, we may not have a good understanding of the deterioration process. And this understanding is related to one, the causes, and two, the rate of deterioration. And then a third leg would be how to repair the structure, but that is not a subject of, of this uh, talk today. Then uh, another reason why our structures are deteriorating prematurely is because of uh, having inadequate uh, acceptance uh, criteria. This, of course, is directly related to the first point, which is poor understanding of the deterioration processes. If we don't have that poor understanding of the deterioration processes, in as much as we may be so stringent and strict in terms of enforcing our acceptance criteria, we may still not be able to achieve uh, uh, the durability performance that we need in the, in, in the long run. And then uh, a third one is uh, changes in, uh, in, in material properties in general, cement being a major one, and of course in construction practices with time. And this relates to the variability in the construction process and also in the, in the quality of the material. So I, I will not be so much far off if I say that we really have a crisis in terms of concrete durability. A lot of our structures are deteriorating prematurely and we need to invest a lot of, uh, of our resources in terms of human capital uh, and also money to, to really keep the structure standing and functional. So this is a crisis and we really need to address this. It has uh, a number of, uh, of consequences. I'll just uh, try and mention a few. Of course, uh, owners need longer service lives. When, when, we, when clients approach us, they want the structures to last long. Long is, is, is relative. Most of the time in terms of uh, whether it's, uh, it's a bridge, clients may require, let's say, 50 to 100 years maintenance, maintenance free life. Uh, so we really need to think about how to achieve this, uh, this demand. And of course, in terms of uh, capital expenditure, we really need to think about how we, 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 we invest this, uh, this, uh, this capital because we know that in developing countries uh, of which uh, a lot of this uh, are in Africa, we really need to think about uh, how this investment can really serve, serve us for as long as, as, uh, as it can, so that the capital expenditure is worthwhile in terms of return on investment. And then uh, we also have to think about developing engineering solutions uh, so that we can have confidence uh, in our, 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 our infrastructure in terms of their performance uh, from a serviceability point of view in the long run. So as uh, structural engineers, as uh, concrete technologists, as people interested in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this field, we really need to, to really have uh, this, uh, this uh, mindset of really thinking about finding solutions on, on a continual manner, really, uh, so that we can attend to these uh, uh, consequences uh, and the demands that relate to them adequately. Just before we proceed, I'll just present some facts that uh, we really need to know before we proceed. 
We know that uh, one, my first fact is, is that concrete is very forgiving when it comes to strength. When I talk about strength, I'm referring to compressive strength in this month, in this case. Uh, you can have a structure like uh, the one on the far top right. This structure could be a column, for example. You could have uh, like a, a balustrade on the bridge, concrete. Uh, these structures uh, or these elements will really not uh, fail most of the time from a structural point of view. I mean, we, we understand that uh, we, if we specify, for example, a concrete uh, compressive strength of 30 MPa, our service, our service stresses are usually much, much lower than that. So to a large extent, even if concrete is not cured at all, it will not fail uh, from, a, from a strength point of view. The contrary is, is, uh, is, is that uh, durability is not that forgiving when it comes to this, uh, this concept. So if you have a structure that has this kind of concrete elements, this structure will of course stand, but it will not be able to, 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 to really uh, serve the, the design life that uh, it's expected to, to, to serve. That's fact number one. Fact number two is that uh, we need to understand that strength is important. And uh, from a structural point of view, that is something that we really need to think about. Compressive strength is important, but it should not be taken as a proxy for durability. And uh, concrete structures uh, could, be, could have uh, adequate strength and stability, but they might not be durable. So these two facts are very important moving on, and we really need to think about them. Uh, the bottom line is that strength is not everything, and, 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 and we really need to think about uh, durability as something that, we, that uh, should be taken into account uh, from the design point of view going forward. So we really cannot ignore durability. And as stakeholders in, uh, in the field of, uh, of concrete, we really need to appreciate uh, the, the, the importance of, uh, of, of the aspects of, uh, of the design, specification, and constructing for durability. And we will talk about this uh, going forward. Uh, I've been talking about durability, but what really is durability? So if we look at these two structures, for example, and I ask uh, you to tell me which of these structures is durable, what would be the answer? I wouldn't expect an answer now, but uh, I mean, uh, it's impossible to answer that question if I ask, uh, if I post uh, that question to you. The reason being, we will see that now, you cannot say that this structure is not durable or was not durable. You cannot say that this structure is durable. And we will see why that is the case. So from a definition point of view, if we define durability, we're talking about uh, a structure and it should be able to, to survive in its uh, design uh, service condition, that's the exposure environment, without uh, any significant deterioration. Or if there is deterioration, we can we can fix that with minimum maintenance. So basically, that's what uh, durability is about in a nutshell. It has two components. The first component is the concrete system, which is what we are focusing on today. And then we have a second component, which is the exposure environment. So these two components are quite important, and that's why we say that durability is really a context and environment related parameter. We really need to think about the concrete context and also, and also the environment so that we can be able to define durability. I'm hoping that by now you could respond to my question appropriately, but we will proceed. Now, in terms of the concrete system, there are factors that we really need to think about. We need to think about the type of cement that we use, we really need to think about the amount of cement that we use. And in this case, I need to, to, to state it clear that it's not the amount of cement that you use that determines how good your concrete is from a durability point of view, but it is, uh, it is really the, the, the type of cement. Water to cement ratio is uh, equally important for durability, just like it is for, 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 for strength. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the consequences of, of, of high water cement ratio are much more grave for, for, for durability than for strain. Then we also think about the materials, and of course, basically mixed proportioning, which is basically what we need to think about from a durability point of view. 
Having that in place doesn't mean your concrete is going to be of good quality. What is also important is how this concrete is produced. Uh, production of concrete uh, from mixing to placement to, to, to compaction, all this need to be thought about very carefully. Keywording is very important, especially for durability as already indicated. If you don't cure your concrete, you can't achieve the, 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 the desired strength, but you may not get away with durability. Uh, early age thermal temperature history, this relates to the heat of hydration, which could be detrimental, especially if uh, high cement contents are used. So that's on the side of concrete, the concrete system. Then on the other side, we have the environment. And on the environment side, we really need to, we really need to think about uh, either deterioration, deterioration physically or from chemical causes. Uh, we could talk about uh, abrasion, erosion, uh, and things like that. Or we could talk about uh, uh, chemical deterioration mechanisms, like, uh, for example, steel corrosion, which is uh, one of the main causes of deterioration in our, in our country structures, especially in the, in the, in the coast, uh, coastal regions. Alkali silica reaction, sulfate attack, all these uh, chemical deterioration mechanisms are quite important. Now, having understood that, so from a durability point of view, we need to design for it. And, uh, and you may understand that so from structural point of view, you need a load and resistance. So from a durability point of view, the concrete system is really your resistance. So the concrete quality is very important. So from a resistance point of view, we really need to, to think about uh, the penetrability or quality of the concrete and also the cover depth uh, and condition of the concrete. So this is very important. Achieving the correct cover depth is very important. You can see in this picture, cover depth is almost uh, close to, to, to nothing really. So this is very important from a durability point of view. And you will see a lot of structures having this sign of duration, especially those that, that are affected by, by corrosion. So that's on the, on the resistance side of view. The penetrability or the quality of the concrete is important and also the cover depth, but not only the cover depth, but also the condition. Condition here relates to things like, for example, uh, controlling the crack weight of the, of, of the concrete from the design point of view. Like for, and, and we do this for when, when we carry out structural design. So we really need to think about the consequences of not uh, minimizing our crack widths uh, uh, during the design stage, at the design stage. Then on the load side, this is now where we think about the environment. And when we talk about the environment, we're talking about the aggressivity of that environment. So for example, if we talk about a marine environment, we are thinking about uh, steel corrosion as a result of uh, ingress of chlorides into concrete. So we really need to think about uh, the type of cement we use, uh, the cover that, that we use, uh, concrete, the, 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 the in-situ, on-site on uh, quality control measures that are in place. So that is important. So the question is, how do we then, uh, uh, how are we able to quantify durability load and resistance? And, and these are the, some of the things that uh, I will touch on as we, as we proceed. So now let's move, if we move on to designing for durability, the question is then what does it really involve? And there are two aspects to this. The first aspect uh, involves service life modeling. And when you talk about service life modeling, we are talking about understanding the dissolution mechanisms. Remember when we started this talk, I mentioned that lack of understanding of dissolution mechanisms is one of the reasons why we have a lot of structures that are dissolved. So a good understanding of this deterioration mechanisms is quite important. It also involves uh, testing, and in this case, really, we need to we need to we want to understand the rate of ingress of harmful species in the concrete, whether it's the chloride, whether it's uh, it's uh, for example carbon dioxide or any other harmful species into concrete, we can only do this by testing. So relevant testing is quite important. We will talk about the durability index tests that are being used in South Africa later on in this talk. Then ultimately, service life modeling results in the development of service life models. And this is what is most important. And these are used for predicting deterioration. When you talk about predicting deterioration, we are predicting either the rate of deterioration, 
all of the degree of acceleration. So these two are, are what uh, really these service type models help us to do. So that's on the one leg of, of, of durability side. The other leg of durability design really involves uh, involves uh, the five percent. So this is, for example, an example of, of a service like model. This is one that is used for for chloride induced corrosion in terms of. Uh, from a design point of view, it helps with choosing the type of cement, uh, things like uh, the cover depth, and you can also use it for existing structures to predict the residual life. So on the other on the other leg, we have uh, the design uh, life, service life design. Okay, and when you talk about service life design, we are talking about a structure being able to have adequate serviceability over the, the, the desired life of the structure. So on this side, we're really talking about uh, quantification uh, of the aggressiveness of the structure. Uh, I mean, aggressiveness of the exposure environment, and we have already mentioned uh, things like the marine environment, if it's uh, in the inland industrial areas, we need to quantify how aggressive these environments are. For example, the seawater in Cape Town might not be as, uh, as may, might not have the, the same salinity or pH as the one in, for example, Port Elizabeth or Dublin. So we need to think about uh, this thing. When it comes to the inland environment, we really need to think about uh, things like CO2 concentrations in the air, uh, comparing industrial areas, comparing car parks uh, to, to, to areas that are just uh, open and not so exposed to these kinds of activities. So for us to carry out so service like design for durability, we really use the service like models that uh, are developed at the at the service life modeling stage. That's why this service life modeling is quite important. And ultimately, we want to be able to specify for durability. And, and this is really what uh, uh, ultimately service life design ends up in. So we want to, to, to specify things like the depth of cover to, to the steel reinforcement, the performance requirements, for example, durability index that we will talk about later on. So this is what it involved, but it is not as easy as it seems. And the reasons for this are quite vast. I'll mention a few here. We have changing environments, like for example, global, global warming, increases in CO2 concentrations in the air. We have uh, new materials in terms of aggregates. Now we are talking a lot about using recycled aggregates, uh, artificial aggregates, and so on. We have new types of cements. How do we incorporate this in our, in our, in our service life models and designs? We have uh, inadequate knowledge of, of some of the models because uh, of how they were developed. And of course, uh, there is uh, variability in construction quality. And that is uh, to some extent uh, informed by having different perceptions in terms of what service life means. And of course, uh, we cannot uh, lie that we are able to verify our designs in the long run. So this, of course, is something that we keep on uh, monitoring in terms of, uh, in, of, of existing in-service structures and updating models appropriately. But it is something that we really have to acknowledge that it is beyond the, our reach, at least uh, at the design stage, when using models that uh, have not been especially calibrated using in-service data. Now, from a design point of view, we can design for durability using different approaches. The first approach, uh, and, and uh, this is what uh, has been used uh, in the past, is what we refer to as a prescriptive approach. So this approach really where mixed parameters are prescribed, uh, you tell the contractor the type of cement to use, the minimum cement content to use, you, you prescribe the maximum water cement ratio to use, uh, and the challenge with this is that we cannot really characterize concrete uh, resistance to, to, to penetration by harmful, in harmful substances, which means we cannot be able to, to predict uh, the, the performance of our structure from a durability point of view. On the opposite end, and this is where we really need to go to, and that's what, what this talk is about, is the performance-based approach. So in this case, we really have clear performance criteria. And uh, of course, it's uh, because of that, we have good tests, we can, we can have confidence in terms of potential durability of a concrete. And 
most important is that it allows for innovation on the part of the contractor. So in this case, we don't have requirements uh, put on the contractor in terms of how the, the performance criteria or the durability targets need to be achieved. And in this case, what is also important is that uh, responsibilities are clearly defined. What is uh, what might be interesting to engineers uh, is that uh, in this approach, uh, a lot of shifts uh, is in terms of proportion of the portion of responsibility is uh, is is from from the engineer to the concrete supplier or the contractor. So as as an engineer, you you will specify the targets uh, and. Uh, the contractor needs to, to really ensure that, uh, that those targets are met, and that's where the testing is important. So as I said, we want to move from prescriptive to performance-based approach. We are not yet there. And as it stands, we are somewhere close to, to going into, into performance-based approach. So we are somewhere in between. And what is happening now is that we are basically using a hybrid approach. This means that we are borrowing, we are prescribing some of the performance criteria and some we are basically uh, not, uh, not prescribing. I'll, I'll give a typical example here of, of prescriptive and performance-based approach. And you can see here, for example, you, you, you will specify compressive strength in both. You will specify the placement requirement in both cases. And on the one, on the one hand, in terms of prescriptive approach, you will, you will specify the water to cement ratio, the minimum cement content, and durability is assumed, but when it comes to performance-based approach, durability is prescribed in terms of a performance target. And in this case, we will talk about uh, chloride conductivity, oxygen permeability, and water subjectivity indexes and tests uh, thereof. So here we design for durability. We do not assume durability. So as, it, as I've already indicated now, what we're doing is that uh, we are prescribing some of these aspects, like for example, the type of salmon, but we are also, also uh, prescribing some performance targets that uh, contractors uh, need, to, need to, to achieve. So because of that, uh, we, we are using a hybrid approach as it stands. There are two main approaches in terms of carrying out performance-based durability design. The first one is one which we refer to as a deemed to satisfy approach, where this is mainly based on, uh, on empirical knowledge and data that uh, if uh, concrete uh, that was made uh, using this type of concrete in this type of environment uh, has survived for this long or has proven to, 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 to survive uh, for, 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 for a certain number of years, then we can rely on that to, 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 to design or, or specify concrete going forward. Otherwise, we have to use a rigorous approach where I basically start from scratch, quantifying the specific environment and, uh, and, uh, and basically developing our mixed designs. And that's where we want to go. Okay, so now I'll just give a brief overview of what uh, the performance-based design approach really involves. Uh, the first stage is to identify the location of the, of, of, of the of destruction. After doing that, of course, the next stage is to assess and characterize the aggressivity of the environment. I've already spoken about this, and there are codes that can guide us, for example, the European code in 206, part one. So this can, uh, can guide us in terms of uh, the deterioration, in terms of, uh, of uh, the exposure environment. So it can quantify how aggressive an environment is, and these uh, exposure classes have subclasses in terms of aggressivity. So for example, if you go to carbonation-induced corrosion or chloride-induced corrosion in the marine environment, you will find subclasses for this based on the, the, the aggressivity of each exposure environment. Now, the next stage is to, is to then identify the mode of disruption in the environment. So for example, if you're in a marine environment, you will know that it is chloride-induced corrosion. Uh, if you are in an area that uh, you have, uh, for example, spring water, you may suspect uh, soft water attack and so forth. Then once you identify a suitable service like prediction model, like for example, the one that I gave, this is the case for chloride induced steel corrosion, then you can proceed with service like design. And based on that, you can then design and specify both the fresh and hardened concrete properties, not only durability in this case, but uh, 
We are talking about other 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 concrete requirements. Uh, we need to think about cover depth, uh, measurable durability index parameters, and sometimes you need to specify materials, which is, which is what we are doing now in, in a hybrid approach. Once that is done, we need to test our concrete before construction. And in this case, we need to think about uh, the fresh durability, strength, uh, creep and shrinkage requirements, and, and so forth. So if the concrete doesn't pass, then of course you have to go back to the design. If it does, you, you proceed to the construction. And in construction, what is most important is, uh, is to ensure that the mixing, compaction, cover depth is achieved. Curing is very important from a durability point of view. So all this need to be taken into account so at, at this stage. Then uh, if uh, after construction, we again need to test our concrete to ensure that what we designed for from a durability point of view has been achieved by the contractor. If yes, we accept. If no, of course, we have two options. Either we remedy the, the problems or we reject the structure, which means to demolish and reconstruct until uh, we proceed. Until then, we can be able to accept the concrete or the structure. Now. I'll just focus a little bit more on, on the mixed design aspects. And we know that uh, mixed design is really a multi-objective optimization task. Most of the time we do not aim to achieve, we, we, we are not able to achieve all the targets that we want, whether it is strength, uh, ductility, durability, creep and shrinkage, uh, sustainability, either in terms of cost, uh, environmental impact, social impact. Uh, we, we can also think about uh, the fresh uh, or production process in terms of workability, the thermal requirements, especially if it is uh, huge mass concrete elements. Uh, we really need to think about the level of quality control on site, and this informs uh, can, should also inform our mixed design. We also have aesthetic aspects to, to to think about. So all these aspects need to be to be really optimized and. Most of the time, we, we, we will need to make some, uh, some compromises in terms of, for example, cost uh, and, and or aesthetics and, and so forth. These uh, compromises might not always be good for everyone, especially clients or architects. But from an engineering point of view, we really need to, 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 to decide on what compromises we can make. So if we look at uh, uh, a mixed design process, this is what we have. I mean, I'm not going to go into detail in terms of what this entails, but basically you need to select, so you need to choose the aggregate to use, uh, fresh properties, things like water to cement ratio, the amount of, of cement to use, uh, if you're going to use some admixtures. So all these aspects need to be taken into account. I am presenting this, uh, this uh, flow chart here because we need to understand if we don't get a satisfactory mix, we need to understand what parameters of the process or what aspects of the mix design uh, process really contribute or contributed towards that. Was it the mixing? Was it uh, the, the, the type of cement? Was it uh, the type of aggregate? Was it the condition of the aggregate? So all this, we really need to have a good understanding of the materials and how this uh, the different ingredients affect uh, the, the, the results that we get. So the next question is how do I proceed? Uh, basically focusing on durability. I'm not going to go into detail in terms of the mix design process, but I'll, I'll give some, some, some important points to, to really think about. The first thing is to contextualize the durability requirement. This is very important. You cannot design a mixed design for durability if you do not uh, if you if you don't understand uh, the, the the durability requirements and this is what i mean by contextualizing the durability requirements what is most important here is the mode of deterioration we need to understand the mode of deterioration and what concrete uh, properties or parameters affect that uh, mode of deterioration it is only by doing that that then we can be able to really understand and, and control or mitigate that deterioration mechanism or process. The next thing is to understand which mixed ingredients affect the durability requirement, as I've already mentioned. Is it the water to cement ratio? 
If it is water to cement ratio, what can I do to reduce, for example, the water to cement ratio? Should I use a mix just like, for example, super plasticized? Is it the type of cement or is it the content? Okay, so it is always better to minimize cement content as much as possible. For, and, and this, this is, it, it's, it's uh, I think I will show you a graph later on that, that shows how the difference between the paste and the concrete, how this differ. The paste uh, really from a durability point of view is, is, uh, is where is the most uh, porous uh, component of, of concrete. So if we can minimize it as much as possible, then we can really make our concrete dense and less penetrable. We need to think about uh, the type of aggregates uh, that we use. Uh, for example, if we are thinking about, uh, uh, let's say, abrasion, we need to think about uh, the type of aggregates in terms of how, how good these aggregates are. Then, uh, we also need to think about admixture to you. So we really need to think about the aspects that uh, affect durability. This graph here basically shows uh, here, for example, on the vertical axis, time to initiation of chloride induced steel corrosion, and on the horizontal axis, uh, we have the water to sediment ratio. This is basically just to give, give or underscore the points of, of the type of cement here. Okay, so here you can see that slag cement uh, compared to slag and fly ash or basically blended cement concrete will perform much better than, than plain Portland cement or what people normally refer to as uh, OPC. So we want to try as much as possible to avoid using plain Portland cement so that we can improve the durability regardless of the water to cement ratio. Okay, the only time that uh, you start having less influence, you can see here as the water to cement ratio increases, which means of obviously you then have poor concrete, then the influence of your binder type or cement type diminishes. But uh, at low water cement ratios, uh, really, and this is what we want to try and use as much as possible, you, you get better performance from a durability point of view using blended cement concrete. And you would, opt, you would basically go for this, uh, you would question, for example, the workability of this concrete, but we could use uh, admixtures to, to enhance uh, the workability of, uh, of the concrete. Then the next thing to think about, of course, uh, is uh, Is, uh, is the durability, is the testing. My computer had frozen for a while. So the re relevant testing is quite important. And in this case, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about the, ox the, the durability index test. We have the oxygen permeability, water subtivity, and current conductivity index test. This has already been incorporated into science. I will talk briefly, briefly about, uh, about this. So this indices, basically give us the potential durability performance of a given concrete. We have uh, on, the one, on, the, on, the, on the left, we have octane permeability index test. This test basically gives us the resistance of a concrete to gas penetration, very useful in terms of uh, designing for durability of concrete structures in inland environment or areas that have high CO2 concentrations because it is related to carbonation induced corrosion. Then we also have, uh, I don't know why my computer is, is uh, slow. Can you hear me? Yes, we can still hear you, Mark. Okay. My computer seems to have frozen. I... Okay, so the next point, the next test uh, is, uh, let me try and see if it's working, no. Okay, it seems to work. So we have the water subtivity test. Uh, this test basically gives us the resistance of, of a concrete absorption by water. It's very sensitive to curing. So most of the times this test can be used to assess the effectiveness of, of a curing method, whether it's a curing compound, 
So you can easily use this test to assess how effective a queuing method, how or how effective queuing was. So it's very sensitive to degree of hydration, which is related to, to, to how well queuing has been implemented. Then uh, we have the chloride conductivity test, which gives us uh, the resistance to penetration by chlorides. And it's, this test is very sensitive to, to the type of cement. And we will see later on, for example, how specifications to take that into account. Uh, it's mainly useful for marine environments, coastal areas that have high chloride contents uh, because this causes uh, steel corrosion. So as, as already indicated, these tests have been incorporated into SANS. So if you if you are interested, you can have a look at SANS 3001, uh, colon CO3, there's that one, two, and three, except for the water subjectivity index that we are still working on. Now, sampling is very important in terms of this test. So we can either do lab sampling or we can do sampling from, from some from some, uh, specimens that are cast uh, on, on in situ or from home structures. But what is most important is from a, from a specification point of view is to understand the relationship between results obtained from the lab and from the site. This is, uh, we already do this uh, in the case of compressive strength. Uh, the only difference uh, would be that uh, in the case of compressive strength, we rely more on uh, on uh, on the lab results as opposed to to the field field results from a design point of view. Now, this is what I'm trying to indicate here. If you look at uh, this uh, frequency distribution here on the vertical axis, uh, the number of tests, uh, the DI test results on the horizontal axis. Now. If you look at this, these are two normal distributions. Uh, this dotted normal distribution here indicates the distribution of uh, the in situ durability test results, okay, with the mean uh, here. And of course, uh, we have the characteristic uh, value uh, depending on, on, on the level of uh, how, how much uh, defectives you need which is uh, what we do in the case of strength as well. So that's what you, that's the distribution of results you would expect uh, from site with the mean at that point. But if you test, uh, if you get uh, specimens in the lab, then you will obviously have uh, better performance. So you will have uh, better durability performance. Uh, and so the question is how do we relate to uh, the target value that we, that we want which is uh, based on the results we get from the lab to those that we will get in the lab, okay? So we need to know that margin and that's what basically specification involves. We need to take that into account when specifying our concrete because we are relying on this distribution, the solid line, solid distrib normal distribution, which is based on, uh, on results obtained from the lab. But in reality, we want uh, our structures will, the results in our structures will follow this dotted distribution, which is what we get from site specimens. So how do we relate these two means, taking into account, of course, uh, the margin of error that we, that we have for, for site specimens. So quality control becomes uh, quite important. So these are just how the results are interpreted, interpreted. Uh, oxygen permeability, water subjectivity, and chloride conductivity. I really want to go much into that uh, uh, in terms of the interpretation. I'll just uh, show some examples here. So in this case, uh, for example, this is uh, a case of, uh, of uh, chloride conductivity index. Uh, uh, and you see here for the different exposure classes in terms of aggressivity you have the different types of bindings. As I already indicated, the chloride conductivity index is quite sensitive to the type of cement. So for a given cover of 40, for a 50 year service life, you can use either fly ash, slug, or silica fume blended uh, cement. And if depending on the type of blended cement you use, you will then have a different target value. Uh, and this is something that we really need to, to, to think about uh, because uh, these cements uh, have different uh, chemical compositions and this affects uh, 
especially from a chloride penetration point of view, the rate of, of diffusion of chlorides into those concrete. So when we specify the chloride conductivity index for, for, for structures, we really need to also be, be cognizant of the type of cement. That is not the case uh, for, for the for oxygen permeability index, which has already indicated is mainly for inland environment from a carbonation induced corrosion point of view. In this case, what is most important is the cover depth to the steel and, uh, and, uh, and of course the oxygen permeability value, not very sensitive to, to the binder type. Uh, this is a case, uh, again, what is important in terms of, accept, uh, of interpretation is the acceptance criteria. So in terms of acceptance criteria, we need to think about uh, the graph that I've already indicated in terms of the distribution of the results uh, for, for lab and also for site. How do these two relate? And that can help us in terms of defining the acceptance criteria, whether we accept uh, or reject. This is just an example from, 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 from some of the, from, from a project, uh, Sandra project, and this is how they define how they accept or whether they, they determine that the results are satisfactory or not satisfactory hence and rejection. So the durability index tests are quite important uh, to engineers and they help engineers in terms, of, in terms of specifying the performance targets and, and acceptance criteria. This is very important for, for at the design stage. You need to specify the optimal permeability index, the conductivity index, or the water subjectivity index, depending on your exposure environment. You don't always need to specify all of them. You need to choose which ones to specify. Then it can also help us in terms of approving mixed proportions if needed. And this happens from time to time that engineers are asked to approve mixes. So it, this test can also help us in that regard. And it can also help after construction to verify the as built concrete quality. This is quite important so that you can ensure that what you designed and specified has actually been achieved or was achieved by the contractor. Now, from the contractor side, these tests are also helpful in terms of uh, selecting suitable mix ingredients in terms of the type of cement to use, the water to cement ratio, admixtures, uh, and so forth. But uh, most importantly, uh, it also helps the contractor to put in place uh, adequate uh, quality control in terms of mixing, compaction, curing, and so forth. So I'll, I'll summarize a few things to remember in terms of a mixed design uh, of concrete point of view from performance-based durability point of view. Now, the type of cement is, is, is important. As I've already indicated, we should try and avoid using Portland cement. The, the, the consequences, of course, are many from a sustainability point of view. Costs uh, are, are all, uh, not, nothing really is on the side of plain Portland cement. Whether it's in terms of uh, looking at, for example, strength, if you look at compressive strength development, you will find that uh, if you use blended cement concrete, you will have slower strength development, but in the long run, they tend to have slightly higher compressive strengths uh, than, than, than plain Portland cement. Whether that is uh, required or not is not the issue here. The most important thing here is that uh, these concretes are going to give you much, much better durability than the plain Portland cement. Now, in terms of trying to minimize the cement content, this is also important, whether it's in terms of cost, uh, sustainability, uh, in reducing the best content, as I already indicated, for example, if you compare the, the, the this is uh, the permeability on, on the vertical axis uh, of, of cement paste uh, and, and concrete, you will see that uh, your cement paste uh, has, uh, has a higher, permeability compared to, to, to your concrete. So we need to try, try and avoid that. And then we need to try to minimize use of excessive admixtures. What is important to note here is that admixtures are not meant to fix bad concrete. You cannot have a bad concrete and, 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 and expect that admixtures will fix that. Admixtures are only meant to either modify or enhance the either fresh or hardened properties of your concrete. Now, having done all that, uh, there is no assurance that you will still get good concrete. 
you still need to do much more than that. So just designing and specifying for concrete feasibility is not enough. What is most critical after design and specification is that we ensure that good side practices are put in place from mixing, compaction, cover depth and condition, and most importantly, the verification and testing. These are quite important. So in my closing remarks, uh, I will want to say that uh, we have two options that we, we, we follow in terms of uh, durability design from a performance-based uh, concrete uh, durability design. Now, we either carry out what is the, and this is on, on the left-hand side, this is what we mostly do, carrying out structural design, then followed by durability design. That's one option on the on the on the right hand side. We either have we have these two structural design and durability design. These two teams are in uh, in in tandem working together. So it's either that durability is an add-on or it's an integral part of design. Of course, we don't want to go that route. We want to to ensure that uh, durability design is an integral part of the structural design process. So what is the way forward? Uh, and this is my last uh, slide, uh, last, uh, last uh, point here in terms of the way forward. We need to, to, to ensure that uh, for us to achieve uh, performance by durability designers, including uh, mixed design of concrete, most important thing is to have a scaled workforce. And on that end, we need, uh, of course, uh, education. So all parties that are involved need to have a good understanding of what affects durability and what, especially in terms of what parameters affect uh, concrete durability. And then uh, most importantly, we need to ensure that there is cooperation and, and change of mindset. It's very difficult to change the mindset of engineers, especially experienced engineers, but this is what needs to happen. There is no other way than, than these two things happening. If we really want to ensure that uh, that uh, our performance based durability design and specification of concrete structures is adequately implemented. Thank you very much.